I'm going to start with a very basic question, but I think one that probably a, a lot of people are wondering, and that's just, why are you here? You know, obviously we invited you to come speak, that's part of the reason, but I want to know, um, why are you back in front of this particular audience, and why are you at it again with another company? I think, first of all, thank you for having me. And always nice to see a great face in the audience. And Park City is beautiful. I've never been here in the summer. Okay. It's unbelievable. Very nice to see. I think in life we go through many journeys. And as we go through these journeys, we, we have different lessons that we learn. But if we learned our lessons and we don't get a chance to do it again, then I don't think you can really apply it. And I think when things happen in your life, if you took time to think about it and learn from it, then, and then you apply it, that's a great journey. But if you actually didn't learn from it, and you stopped, and something happened, it becomes a tragedy. So I'm here because I love entrepreneurship, and I think this category and this problem is real, and we're excited to do our part in trying to solve it. So we're gonna get into flow and what you're doing with it today, what your hopes are, um, but I wanna talk about those lessons learned, um, first of all. And just ask you, you know, you've had quite a bit of distance and time now from WeWork. Um, looking back with the space that you have and the perspective, what do you think were the biggest mistakes? What are the biggest learnings that you take with you today? So uh, when I stepped down in 2019, I actually took the time to think a lot and had a great team around me that we were able to talk and discuss all the different things. And there are many lessons, but first of all, I would say I'm extremely proud in what we did in WeWork. I'm proud of the team. Today, WeWork has over 700 locations. It's in 39 countries. It's in over 70 languages. And I don't think there's a person on the planet who's building a new office space today who's not thinking what would or wouldn't WeWork think. So I think that part was great. As far as the lessons, um, there are many, and we don't have enough time today. This is a short interview. Give us but, your top. But I'll focus, I'll focus on two that come to mind right now. One, as an entrepreneur, there are many things you don't control. One of the only things you control is who you surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. And not just who you surround yourself with, but exactly what kind of people they are. I think in WeWork, we're surrounded by very smart people. But moving forward, what I surround myself with is not just very smart people, but also people who are very comfortable telling me what they think. And when you need to tell someone what you think and they don't agree with you, you need to have the courage and you need to be empowered to go back again and say it again and again and again. So my first lesson, surround yourself not only with the best people and the smartest people, but also the ones who are gonna tell you what they think. And it means if you don't listen, they're gonna keep at it until you either never see them again or until you agree. That's one. The second one is listening. The first lesson doesn't work without the second one. After, when I stepped down from WeWork, I had the opportunity to become an investor. And our family office invested in over 50 different companies. And I got to be the investor giving the entrepreneur advice and seeing that the entrepreneur is not listening and getting a little frustrated until I realized that maybe this is part of how I used to act. Mm -hmm. And I realized that part of being a great entrepreneur is not just listening, but listening to the hard truth, listening to the things you don't want. So if I had to choose two, choose who you surround yourself with, and become a great listener, and great listeners like to listen to what they don't want to hear, not what they want to hear. So do you, uh, if I'm to put, like, put all of that together, do you think that your investor at the time uh, at WeWork could have played a larger role in not helping to create what was a spectacular rise and then a spectacular fall? I mean, what was your role there and what was your investor's role? Again, as I said before, I am so proud of what we did. And Monday night quarterbacking, is that what you call um, doing that now with the investors and what they should have done, not, I can tell you one thing, no one from the outside ever knows what happens in the inside. And again, I think very few people disrupt categories and very few companies reinvent categories. Uh, Office is the second largest category in the world and I'm very proud of what was achieved. Okay, I want to ask you about, um, uh, my understanding is that there were, there were several components of your exit package which was controversial at the time. Um, but one of those components was also a non-compete agreement, and when does that expire? Our non-compete expires. It's actually a non-compete and an unsolicit, and that expires October 30th of this year. Okay. So what happens then? Does this mean that you, with your new company, which we will get to in a second, compete with WeWork? To answer that question, I would have to explain what flow is, because I think the, the answer is slightly more complex. 
Flow is building a consumer-facing residential brand, and we're doing it through integrating technology, community, and a world-class operating team that puts the resident first. And just some numbers for those of you who don't know, 66% of young adults in this country are renters. Uh, they spend 34% of their total income on rent, and yet there's no brand, no promise, no elevated experience. In the past, Howard Schultz, who is a great entrepreneur and also a company that I really admire, came up with the concept of the third place. He would say the first place was the home, the second place was the office, and the third place was Starbucks, where you could get a cup of coffee, meet someone, and be surrounded by other people. I think in a pre-corona world, that was amazing. I think in a post-corona world, what Flo has observed is that it's not anymore the first place or the third place, it's the one place. Mm -hmm. And in the one place, you have to integrate everything. Our residents, which we survey regularly, 70% of them spend between two to five days working from home. In a reality where work from home and living has become one, a place where our home has changed and our relationship to our home has changed. I don't think a lot of us think there's anything more important than that. The new solution for the future of living needs to be more the one place as opposed to the first or the third. And that's what Flow is going to do. To answer your question, you said, is Flow, I think what you're asking is, what's Flow going to do? Well, and, and does Flow, where does, where does we work end and where does Flow begin and where do they dovetail? Will so, you compete? So you're asking, is Flow going to compete? Yes. I think with, not I think, I know. In a world where the one place is the new solution, where work and living has been integrated, where we're not ready actually for these solutions because these buildings have not been designed for that. The operating systems are not there, the tech is not there, the teams are not there to run it. I think Flow has only two choices, compete or partner. Okay, so compete is one of the choices. Compete is one of the choices. Or partner. Okay. Are the two um, choices there. All right, well maybe it would help if you, you know, I think we get kind of the philosophy um, and the need in the, in the market that you see for flow. But give us a bit more of a, a concrete breakdown of what is the business model? Do you own these buildings or not necessarily? And, and how does the company make money? So I'm going to add one more thing and then I'm going to answer that. In May, the Surgeon General came out with a study defining loneliness as an epidemic in the United States. He was saying that it's going to cause loneliness, it's going to cause mental illnesses, it's going to cause early death. He was giving all these different definitions and quoting tremendous amount of study. We live in a world where we're so connected, we've never been more disconnected. Even though we love technology and flow is tech first and product first, we use technology as a tool to achieve the mission and the goals that we have, not as the end goal. And with that in mind, it has to all be brought together perfectly. So we think the best way to do that business model, we own 3,000 apartments that we're running. We have over 150 employees, a, a majority of engineers, product designers, both digital and physical. We're actually looking for a lot more great employees. Mm -hmm. And the business model that we have is a vertically integrated system. We own the buildings, mm -hmm. we operate the buildings, we build the technology, we, we build a community, and we build the teams that are running them. And when you bring all of that together, the moment a resident is happier, more fulfilled, and stays longer, the building's churn goes down. Churn is the amount of times people leave a building, and the building is immediately more profitable. Happier residents, more fulfilled residents, equals more profitable buildings. We've already proven this on our first two buildings, and this is something that in real estate you don't see often, because real estate is not treated as a consumer product, even though it really is. The reason it's not treated as a consumer product is because it's a supply challenge, not a demand challenge. Um, you raised $100 million from Mark Andreessen, um, correct? No. no. Sorry, how much? Um, $350 million. Excuse me, I should have looked at my notes. $350 million, that's even more mind-boggling. Um, I want to hear about just very briefly, um, tell us about just why you think this is a good match, Andreessen Horowitz and, and you, and also curious to hear you know, not everybody gets a second chance and not on this kind of level, of course, 350 million. Um, why do you think Mark believed in you and wanted to put his money in you? So a few things. First, we spoke about lessons learned and we said one of them is surround yourself with the right people. Mark and Ben and A16Z are unbelievable investors. 
They're actually investors who started as entrepreneurs. They've run multiple businesses and created multiple businesses. When they're in the boardroom and we're discussing, not only is no one holding anything back, the kind of advice we're getting has a lot to do with building a long-term business. Also, and this is something amazing about Mark, after our first board meeting, Mark calls me the next day and he goes, Adam, I wanted to give you some feedback about something I heard in the board meeting. And I said, of course. And then he gave me the list of all the things he disagreed with. Not the things he said in the board meeting, but there are a lot of other things that he thought about afterwards. And he said, I don't want to come too hard, but that's what I think. And I said, Mark, the deal we made when we did this deal is that you always tell me exactly what you think, and I will do my best to be a great listener. And that's been the relationship ever since. They've turned out to be even greater partners than I would imagine. Specifically to what uh, you're asking, I am sure there are people who deserve uh, to get investments more than me. I am sure there's a lot of people who deserve who, who don't get it. And I hope, because I really believe in entrepreneurship, that the people who deserve to get these investments uh, will get it because I also think that to build a future, we need startups and we need innovation. And that's what this conference is all about. I think it shouldn't matter what race they come from, what gender they come from, where they come from, nothing should matter. And everybody should get their opportunity. Specifically, why I got the second chance, that you should ask uh, A16Z. Are you comfortable today describing Flow as a real estate company or what is it, what category is it in? So I can't answer the end without answering the beginning. I'm a little bored of talking about the past, but if, if we must, uh, our valuation was given by the most sophisticated uh, valuers in the world. Mm -hmm. It was Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley. It was SoftBank and Benchmark and all the other investors that are considered the best investors in the world. So when people knock our valuation, they're really knocking all the people who gave that valuation. Mm -hmm. Evaluation is something that's given by a person that wants to actually invest the money. Mm -hmm. Putting that aside, we used to describe we work in many different ways. Flow is very comfortable being a residential consumer facing real estate company. It is the largest asset class in the world. It has no brand that we know of. And prop tech in that category is still very early because whenever you solve these problems, everyone is solving them as a single point problem as opposed to actually solving them as a vertical integration problem. So the way we're going after it is going to take longer. We're going to have to build a very solid foundation. But when we do, I think our solution is going to actually help solve problems like loneliness, community. And I'll say one more thing. You know, I think we live in this world today where I'm not sure we need more followers. Mm -hmm. I think we need more friends. And I think we can all appreciate a lot more face-to-face -face interaction and maybe a little less FaceTime. Well, Adam, we appreciate you coming, getting dressed up for us. No t-shirts today. Um, but thank you so much for coming.